Okay. There we go. Hi, Hi Bo. Hi there. How are you? I'm good. Good. Um, good. So welcome everyone. Hi, Bo, again. Um, thank you for joining us this Saturday afternoon. I am here at McLean Gallery at in um, Bo's third solo show at McLean Gallery, Feeding the Beast. And we're just going to have a conversation about this show um, and, and uh, see some of the work that are in your studio. Great. So um, let me flip my camera here and we'll take a look around the gallery. So this is a show that includes your works on paper, which are sort of fairly well known if um, people are familiar with your work. And it also includes four sculptures, wall, wall reliefs, um, that are sort of a new series for you. And um, so I'm excited to kind of take a look at that with you. So I thought it would be a good place to start um, to, talk, to have you talk a little bit about the title of the show, Feeding the Beast, and, um, and then we'll sort of jump from there. Sure. Um, so I was working on a piece that's just behind you, um, <clears throat> the one with the sort of darker green, and um, it incorporates some imagery from uh, mythology and the Bible and so forth taken from Renaissance prints, uh, which is, that's the case with everything in the show. But this particular one, one of the prints I, I lifted from was uh, an image of, of, I believe it's Hercules, it might be. I'm not sure, but a couple of gladiators basically battling this this uh, hydra, and it's fragmented and you know in in the piece because it's sort of all these things overlapping and creating areas of focus where they overlapped and intersected, and it was like you know they're both kind of killing this beast and taming this beast, but they're also kind of it almost looks like they're feeding a beast or shoveling coal into a into a furnace or something. And the phrase feeding the beast came to mind. And I chuckled because I was like, wow, that's a lot like painting. <laughs> you know, while on the one hand, you know, it basically just means devoting endless energy to a pursuit that's like self-perpetuating um, as, as opposed to a pursuit that's being motivated from by some outside force. Mm -hmm. And it's often used to talk about endless expansion of the military and, and war, but it can also be applied to, it is often applied to lots of things like gambling or drug use or, you know, consumerism, these kinds of things, this kind of these self-perpetuating endeavors. Um, and I was just thinking about how art making is also can be similar to that. You know, you have these uh, beasts that emerge in the form of dogma in the form of self-consciousness in the form of obsessive compulsion in the form of you know challenges you take on visually that you're trying to resolve and you know you can back yourself into corners and but they're all monsters of your own making um so i liked that mm -hmm. ha that double play that it spoke about being an artist and the artistic practice but it also spoke to kind of you know society and culture and uh the kind of perpetuation of these you know I don't know, voraciousness and all of this stuff that goes on in society and in the guise of progress, you know, but it's really motivated by appetites for power and profit and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, I guess, is a little bit of a jump. So there are three works in the show um, mm -hmm. that obviously include, all of them include your, this sort of um, radiating line feature that you, you know, usually use in your works on paper. Right. And three of them do not have any of those radiating, radiating lines in the sort of center of the composition. Right. Um, you've sort of kept that to the outsides 
and which it's is obviously which, very a, a deliberate. Right, that's more that's more typically how I use that device. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's rare that the lines sort of leak in quote quote unquote into the sort of central area, and that has to do with how that device first started, mm -hmm. which. The, um, the very first piece in this series of kind of patchwork, a regular patchwork of, of paper on a large scale, and then the layering of the tempera acrylic, oil pastel, et cetera. The very first one, I was sort of enlarging a, a really dense <clears throat> um, drawing that I'd been working on for a long time. It was actually a piece of tracing paper that I was using to, or sorry, uh, carbon paper, I was using to transcribe things on a smaller scale, but I kept using it and reusing it and reusing it. So there was this kind of palimpsest of, of, of imagery that was building up, but unconsciously, meaning it wasn't, mm -hmm. I wasn't composing it. It was just, you know, whatever part of that sheet I was using next. And it turned into this totally unself, unconscious drawing in a way, which I liked that idea that this mass of things had sort of just accumulated un unintentionally. Um, so when I enlarged it and transcribed it and brought it to a certain point, it was so kind of chaotic. And I, and at the same time, um, I wanted to kind of turn that huge field. I wanted to create a kind of compressed mass. And so mm -hmm. I noticed that there were a lot of sort of empty passages in the perimeter. And so I started doing these radiating lines and it became this kind of compulsive, repetitive, almost fetishistic kind of activity until I completed it. And um, like a lot of my work, there were kind of little guidelines and rules for you know, how and where I would apply it. Um, so that's kind of how it started with as a device that from the edges would kind of fill in the, the, the empty spaces or the negative spaces where there were no uh, appropriated forms and at the same time kind of compress the central area into one, you know, continuous mass, contiguous mass. Um, and I don't do it in, in all of the pieces in this whole body of work. Um, mm -hmm. um, so the ones that we were, like the one we were just speaking about, the green one and the one next to it, and then also this red one that you're looking at now, those, um, I think I was I was working on it, and sometimes I get a little disoriented about the sort of positive and negative uh, in the drawings, mm -hmm. and I have to really kind of like, if I'm not super focused, I can sometimes slip, and and it will literally like leak into an area that I didn't fully intend for it to go <laughs> into, and that's just you know again there's all the happy accidents that we try to take advantage of in the practice in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes it's like, okay, well, that's where this drawing clearly wants to go. And so then it will shift kind of how I'm creating visual hierarchies, spatial hierarchies, et cetera. And, um, and so I, in, in, in a few of these, I pushed it in a more overt way, in a, in a less sort of ac purely accidental way and tried to make it a more deliberate and overt feature of, of a few of these works. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, 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 just a, a shift in a series that keeps it interesting for me and invites in new devices and new methods and new ways of dealing with all this appropriated imagery. Um, I, I think it also changes the way the viewer can sort of find their way through these passages and through these, uh, what do you call it, hybrids, you know, cause it's, it's several, um, appropriated images overlap, but I'm only taking the, the negative shapes, essentially. I'm not mm -hmm. really rendering any detail of from the original. In these cases, I'm just dealing with kind of the silhouettes, um, so to speak. And so it just, it, it adds a shift, a spatial shift. And um, I think it also enhances this sort of almost fragmentary effect. I mean, if I don't like to say effect per se, because that's not really how I'm thinking of it, but result, this kind of fragmentary result or fragmentary kind of experience of these things that, I don't know, I think in some ways we retain experiences in life through fragments in some ways, you know, um, mm -hmm. whether they're memories or even things that are happening in the moment. So it's kind of a little bit of a nod to, to that aspect of how we experience things and how we yeah. retain information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this is a good a good place to sort of jump into the wall reliefs. Um, 
which also use uh, a form of radiating line. It's obviously very different structurally speaking, um, right. materially speaking. And um, yeah, so can you talk a little bit about how how different these are from the drawings um, or how differently, you know, you kind of put together your source material. Um, sure. To me, they seem like they're very sort of pared back as far as how many items actually make it in and that sort of thing. So I'll take you on a little stroll through the studio here and this will help guide what, what I'll bring up. So here's the studio. Voila. Um, so, uh, the way that these reliefs started is actually with this piece here. So this isn't actually a finished work. This was something I made, um, just using hot glue and insulation foam, uh, on, um, a piece of foam core that I cut out in the shape of this silhouette. This happens to be, uh, a, a, an African mask from the Sanufo tribe called a Capelli mask. And um, I intended this to be a device that I could use to basically make, you know, transfer uh, wet material onto a painted surface. So I could literally take a roller and, you know, smear on the paint, press it onto a painting. And because it's foam, mm -hmm. I could rinse it off and reuse it. And anyway, this thing was sort of hanging around the studio, uh, kind of bugging me you know, one of those beasts, one of those beasts, so to speak, of my own mm -hmm. making that, that just was kind of lurking around the studio. Um, and I just said to myself, you know, I should make this into a work. Um, so through some trial and error, I actually made a mold of it. I was toying with doing, the, doing it in bronze, which turned out to be impractical. So what I said to myself was, all right, uh, maybe I can you know, build these in some other way. And a friend of mine had turned me on to this thing called aqua resin, which a lot of artists use, and I, but I'd never used it. So I figured out a way to use a more absorbent foam. And here's one that's in mm -hmm. process. Um, and I basically hot glue on row after row after row onto like a cutout. So here's one that I haven't started applying the foam to yet. Um, this is just cut out of a slightly more rigid foam core called gator foam mm -hmm. or gator board. Um, so it's structurally sound, it's inert. Um, and as they get more dense and more dense, you know, they get to a point where it's all filled in. And then I impregnate the surface with this aqua resin, which hardens in the foam. And then I add layers of more resin and fiberglass, et cetera, to really make it rigid and reinforced. And they come to this state where these three are here. Mm -hmm. um, so these are three that I have, you know, finished in terms of the, the fabricating stages and now they're you know prepared for paint uh, but you can see that they're they're literally like hard i mean you could probably hit it with a hammer if you went at it really hard it would probably crack but it, they're they're quite <laughs> stable but they're mm -hmm. also fairly light because it's mostly sort of air inside um so the one that you're showing there on your screen is um uh after it's been painted and so forth. And, and the painting stage is as intuitive as it is in my drawings where I'm kind of, you know, playing with material, playing with color, playing with surface. Uh, there's a lot of sort of trial and error and layering and um, adjusting and so forth. Um, you know, that particular one, I was sort of overtly emulating a color treatment that you see in a number of, uh, tribes from Africa in their in their uh, classical sculpture um, where they use something called kaolin which is a different there's there's white kaolin blue kaolin red kaolin it's just it just refers to a kind of a pigment that's often used to um, color um, uh, masks sculptures etc mm -hmm. and oftentimes it just kind of ends up filling in the crevices and cracks and um, like it does here, but it's yeah. it's also has this wonderful color effect because the brightness of the blue against the black suggests that there's almost like light coming through it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there are some interesting devices like that in uh, classical African sculpture. Like they'll use 
bits of mirror in the eyes of a, of a reliquary figure to, to literally animate it, make it feel as though its eyes are flashing like a human's eyes can, you know, a living human's eyes can. It's all part of kind of animating the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also in some ways, I think what the radiating lines do, you know, in this case, it was, they were forms that came up from all these clippings. I'll go to another table over here and show you guys. So I've been accumulating all of these clippings. This is just a tiny, tiny selection here um, <laughs> for decades. Uh, and I cut them out of auction catalogs. Like this is actually from a photograph that I took that I printed and cut out. Um, they're two-sided obviously, which starts to create some interest and, and you know, uh, unexpected kind of ideas and relationships for me. But I, I've been playing with these things for years uh, in su uh, superimposing them in works on paper and paintings transcribing silhouettes of them, you know, for, for ever, forever, really. It goes back to right after art school. Mm -hmm. But the, the reliefs come from playing with different kinds of, you know, pairings and combinations of these forms, sometimes, you know, from related cultures, sometimes from disparate cultures, you know, here's a Sunufo figure and a Chinese figure. So like, sometimes these things will find their way together and a lot of it is fairly intuitive the choices and 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 the way that they kind of merge sometimes it's based on the abstract nature like i'm looking at the back of something mm -hmm. you know um as opposed to the front of something and some relationship will emerge or there'll be some connection that i see that i didn't hadn't noticed before or some disparity too that's also comes into play um and yeah. so the, the reliefs are basically combinations of these forms uh, as if sort of isolated in, in the drawings and pulled out. And, um, and then the radiating lines, you know, again, because it was intended as a device that was supposed to meld into pieces I was already working on, um, the leap from the radiating lines in the drawings into, the, into these um, reliefs was initially kind of just a practical one, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, and then lo and behold, it was like, oh, I wanna explore this in a more um, committed way. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so this whole, whole new series, you know, kind of came out of that. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, um, the other thing, the, the paint that I use, it's a casein, which is a, a milk protein paint. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, you know, came about similarly to um, egg tempera, kind of in the same era, and was traditionally used in frescoes, uh, but also on, you know, decorative objects, you know, furniture, cabinetry, things like that as well. Mm -hmm. And um, what's nice about it, the reason I chose it is because I wanted uh, something that had a very organic kind of quality, meaning not a kind of a slightly plastic quality that sometimes acrylic has. Um, but I wanted it to be water-based. I wanted it to be, uh, you know, an organic material as much as possible um, because I didn't want to deal with the, the oil so much. I also wanted it to dry quickly because my work, uh, there's so much layering that goes on in my work that if I work mm -hmm. with oil, it, it generally slows down the process too much. So I can't be as intuitive and spontaneous about it. And it turns out, so I, I played with some casein a number of years ago and I thought, oh great, I'll, I'll work with that. It also has this nice, very matte quality when it goes on, but once it's cured after a few days, you can kind of buff it a little bit and it takes on a more of a satiny kind of sheen, which I also liked because um, it just creates more sort of dimension to the, to the mm -hmm. material. Um, and then I realized, oh, wow, a lot of the, the source material, a lot of the things that I'm appropriating actually are painted with the same exact material. And so yeah. I kind of like that. It was like, wow, so I'm, you know, kind of bringing this full circle. I'm, you know, finding photographs of these objects out of context and then shifting them in, again in the way I use them, another shift in context. And then I'm, you know, translating them through these radiating lines. And then I'm, finally painting them using some of the same types of paint that 
the people who made the originals, you know, um, uh, used, which was just a coincidence, but I don't know, there are these little things that happen, serendipitous things that happen that, that give you sort of cues, I think, when you're working and um, they're like little, you know, things that push you in the, in the right direction, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Point, point, points of reference that become like weird little affirmations or something, <laughs> you know, that you're, okay, I'm on the right track or you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it also, I think it kind of mirrors the kind of process you go through with the wall reliefs, which is to, you know, these are originally three-dimensional objects mostly right. that then become 2D and then are translated back into three dimensions in this, you know, very process involved, it was in a, in a sort of complicated process that you undertake, which is great. Yeah, and what what's all those steps that, you know, sometimes people are like, you know, why do you work so hard kind of thing? Like meaning, <laughs> why do you why do you go through so many machinations? I think is what they mean. And um, I'm curious about sort of the, how the contextual shifts of all these human made things over the centuries uh, affects the, um, what the translation or the transmittal, let's say of the energy that's sort of been in them from the, from the, you know, the beginning from their making. Mm -hmm. And that's also partly why I'm so fascinated by ritual objects and so drawn to ritual objects is because um, ritual objects, you know, as opposed to say, <clears throat> you know, uh, objects for like daily use, like a bowl or a chair or something like that, you know, they have a lot more kind of um, charge and, and um, intent is supposed to sort of transcend that object. Um, and the maker is often coming from a place of, you know, a very specific worldview, very mm -hmm. specific kind of set of, of, you know, steps and procedures relative to its ritual intent, et cetera. And so I think that the end product of somebody making one of those objects is more sort of charged or the charge is somehow more high. And then, of course, it goes through all these contextual shifts. When we encounter them, you know, 100 years later, 50 years later, 2,000 years later, they've been affected by time. They're in a totally different place. You know, maybe we see them in a museum in a glass case. Um, in other words, they are abstractions, ultimately. And so when the photographer takes a picture of them in this kind of vacuum of space, um, it becomes an abstraction. But visible in that abstraction is some hum, some, you know, resonance of that original kind of investment in the thing. And I'm fascinated by how that shifts in each contextual change. Um, mm -hmm. And so this idea of, you know, 3D uh, in, in reality, 2D in a photograph, then I'm changing it again, recontextualizing it and so forth. Um, there's sort of this, these, these various sort of translations or iterations of whatever that original energy was. I also find that by looking at the relationships between things as opposed to the things themselves, as obsessive as I get about the things, because I also have a great appreciation for a lot of these objects. You know, they stir me, they intrigue me, they've inspired me for, for years. Um, uh, I'm interested in what the commonalities are too. So even things that are very disparate that get, find their way together in my work, you know, often find these connections and, and underlying commonalities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I call them, um, I call it archetypal charge because it's this idea that there's some sort of charge in these things that when you delve into it <clears throat> speaks to some underlying connections um, that exists through history, through between cultures, all through civilization. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the source material for this piece and maybe the uh -huh. title. Um, to me, it seems like one of the more, well, I'll let you, I'll let so, you tell us a little bit about it. So um, this is um, a piece called Catching Ghosts. 
cymorg. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not actually, actually sure how you pronounce it, but it's a term that came from uh, a Persian poem called The Conference of the Birds, and which I encountered after I made the piece. Um, <clears throat> so each of the forms in here, there's, it's a stack of four objects. The bottom one is from the Sanufo tribe again, and it's a pair of birds that share share wings basically so it's two bird bodies but with one set of wings and then on top of that is a, a fifth i think it's a 15th century or 16th century bronze uh eagle from germany and then up above that on the left is an islamic um i think it was a like a, a bronze bird form that had like mosaic on it or something and then on top of that is this kind of um, uh, mythical bird-like creature represented in, for, in an ancient Roman object. Um, so they're all kind of representations of birds from you know, four different distinctive cultures from four different eras in history. And you know, I was looking at how they're connected. And again, I think that two or three of these were just literally laying on the table and they happen to have been sort of, you know, scooched together mm -hmm. almost as I was moving things around. Uh, and so I played with kind of the tension of the negative spaces and um, this idea of they're this kind of stacked almost like a totem. Um, so that's kind of compositionally how it came about. And as I was looking at all the different kinds of references that I research in these objects, um, uh, I encountered this story about the Conference of Birds, which is a story about these I think it's 30 birds who realize they don't really have kind of a leader and they don't really have kind of a cohesive society, so to speak, and how they ought to. And so they're going to go on this journey to um, resolve that issue. And um, <clears throat> they go through a series of these valleys where there's different challenges that they encounter. Um, and they arrive at the end of the journey discovering this creature called the Cymorg. I, again, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and realize that the Cymorg is actually a, a, a conglomerate or, or a, uh, it's, it's basically a creature made of a whole bunch of birds. And they realize, oh, we are that. We are the Cymorg. And I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a kind of an allegory to tell the story about how we are all connected, about how we are part of a larger whole that we don't even necessarily realize we're a part of when we're functioning autonomously. Um, I think it, this particular story also had, you know, very specific religious underpinnings and it was a reference to God in particular. For me, it's not so grandiose. It's more just this general premise about mm -hmm. how we're interconnected even when we don't feel it, even when we don't think it, even when we're in conflict or even when we're enduring hardships like the birds do when they go through these various valleys and stuff. Um, that's a theme that I've, that's appealed to me for a long time, but even back in school, I made a piece called Saltern, uh, which is a reference to an antiquated machine for make, you know, extracting salt from water. And it was mm -hmm. related to a story about, um, from, I think the Bhagavad Gita, if I remember correctly, and, you know, where a, a father is tells, you know, pours salt in this pool and the son goes over to the pool and he's like, where's the salt? And he's like, it's in there. And he's like, yeah, but I don't do anything. It just looks like water. And he says, taste it over here. And he tastes the salt, taste it over here. And he tastes the salt. And he said, you see, this is how reality is. This is how life is. There are these essences that are there, even if you don't see them. And um, again, it's sort of a similar way of dealing with a similar concept yeah. that is is an aspect of what I'm interested in as an artist too, in general, and kind of exploring all the time. Great, that's awesome. Um, maybe we should switch to questions. Um, I think the way that we planned on doing it is for Sharon to join us via audio. And, oh, great. Um, and yes, I am here, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, excellent. Well, I have um, a, a few questions. Um, I'll begin with one about your source material for this particular body of work. 
The question mm -hmm. is, could you tell us more about the Renaissance prints? Why did you choose historical battle scenes? Okay, so um, I think I was at the Kemper Museum in Kansas City a number of years ago, and they had these three prints up, and uh, they were three kind of battle scenes. One was more of a mythological scene about a battle that was about to ensue. And um, <clears throat> they were just, the, the negative shapes in these three prints were really striking. And I thought, wow, I wonder if they were superimposed and all the detail was taken out, what kinds of interesting relationships might start to emerge. And so I took pictures of them and subsequently did a piece from them that was actually the, the inspiration for the whole body of work that's in this show. Um, and it's that piece sort of stayed with me um, in my mind and I said, okay, I wanna do a whole suite of these things and set about finding more similar kinds of prints. Uh, some of them were more biblical scenes, but they tended to be orientated around big mass kind of masses of people in some kind of deliberation, conflict uh, um, of some kind. And I guess I pursued it and fully developed it because I felt like um, this cacophony, this kind of frenetic discord that, that you could see when they were all layered on top of each other left a kind of a feeling as much as it, as much as it was kind of a translation of literal battle scenes. Um, that just kind of resonated. It just felt like this is how reality feels right now. This is how society feels right now. This is how culture feels right now. It's how I feel right now. Um, but it also provided just incredibly rich raw material for me to be engaged in and dive into. And um, it was also, I think, a way for me to start to widen some of the cultural appropriation that I do. You know, for a long time, I, I borrowed a lot from classical African sculpture, partly because I was working for a, a, an art collector who had a, a massive, massive collection of this stuff. So it was just in my space and in my face and, you know, in my head all the time. Um, and I thought, you know, I know that a lot of that stuff came from colonization and plunder. And I'm somewhat uneasy, even though I have incredible reverence and respect and I do a lot of scholarly research on these things. I also appreciate that these things are their sovereign sources, you know, and that I'm benefiting from them and I'm showing a certain sense of deference and respect for them, but I'm also, you know, capitalizing on them to some degree too. And, and so I was sort of struggling with some of that and thought, well, I want to expand my thesis, widen my thesis and see what happens when even wider cultural references start coming in and thinking of a kind of Eurocentric sensibility versus uh, like, oh, let's look at the cultures that actually did the colonizing <laughs> versus the cultures that were colonized. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's kind of how and why that imagery resonated for me and why I developed it into a sort of a bigger body of work. Great, we've got a couple of questions about your process, particularly in regards to the paper pieces. Um, this one, comes to us from Terrell James. Um, this one, it's, uh, the question is, I'm interested in the way you piece together the paper sheets overlaying the patterning right. and patterning the background of the images. How preconceived is that mapping of the layout of the paper sheet support for the image you plan to work on top of it? Right, so um, because I'm dealing with these kind of large masses of uh, line work and, and of objects, um, there are often kind of at the perimeters, these kind of gaps where there are no objects. And when I did the very first piece in this whole series in 2007, at the time I was, I was actually laying the sheets of paper up uh, to, as a kind of a homemade carbon transfer. And because it was taking so many sheets, because it was such a big piece, I really only placed the sheets where there were, uh, where there was positive forms. I didn't see any point in putting it where there was no object transcribed. And that got set aside. The piece I was working on came to fruition and so forth. And then I came back to all those sheets, pieced it all together, 
and it was was left with these kind of irregular fragmentary edges. Um, so that's kind of how the the sort of you know uh, chipped out portions around the perimeter came to be. In terms of any preconceived way that I'd lay out the sheets, I just start with a full size sheet in a paper that behaves in the way that I like it. It's a laid surface and they come in a certain size, which I have to cut in half because they're kind of large and unwieldy. So I basically start with full sheets and start sort of filling in and laying them up where the positive forms are gonna be and leaving gaps where there are no forms. And depending, because each composition is different and organic uh, and sometimes I have to fit things in in a different way to fill in gaps. Uh, and so it's really more of an intuitive thing where the sheets are kind of accumulating as I pin them up to slowly sort of cover all the surface area where the positive forms are. And, uh, and I'm also trying to overlap them almost like shingles in a way so that they're going to have some structural integrity and it creates some sort of you know, little underlying cubistic schism almost uh, in the seams. But I'm not really composing them visually. I'm not really composing them in terms of line or shape, um, more just structural, more like a, a, a structural kind of ground. So it's, it's a lot of serendipity. It's a lot of, um, you know, uh, impulse. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a great segue into our next question. Uh, in your, I, this attendee don't have their name, uh, but they are, I believe, referencing the video that is in our viewing room for this exhibition. Uh, it states in your video, you spray each piece of paper with a hose. What are you spraying off and how many times must each piece of paper be sprayed? Right, so I'll take you over to this sink that I built many years ago. So this is, a. Um, under here is a five by six foot, you know, kind of dark room sink. It's like a, a, a sort of a tray sink here. Um, and uh, what I use this for is to um, rinse off the pieces at a certain stage. So the initial drawing that I make is an oil pastel. And then uh, while all the sheets are all pinned up, using the approach that I just described. Um, and then I unpin them and take them all down. So there's, you know, maybe 15 smaller sheets. And I coat those with a uh, tempera. It's just like a powdered uh, poster paint. Um, I mix it quite thick. I coat it, I let that dry. And then I scrape those with a razor blade and it doesn't stick wherever the oil pastel was, but it also, scrapes most of the past oil pastel off and also lifts the paper fiber, but because the temper is so thick, it resists the abrasion much deeper than that. Then I coat those with a wash of acrylic um, and let that dry. And then I put them in that sink and I hit them with a hose and a sponge. And what happens is most of the tempera comes off, leaving a little stain or residue in that you know, I can't really control exactly how much sticks, how much doesn't, um, which is part of why I do it. I, it invites a lot of anomalies and stuff. Sometimes there are holes from the scraping stage um, that appear, but the tempera, I mean, I'm sorry, the acrylic actually sticks wherever the um, oil pastel line was. Um, I learned that oil pastel is mostly wax and acrylic actually can stick to wax. I learned that from a conservator many years ago but also the paper fiber has been lifted by the scraping process. So it actually adheres, but it doesn't adhere everywhere. There are places where I have to work it a little harder and sometimes some of the acrylic comes off as well. And uh, it's, it's a little hair raising <laughs> because you, you become attached to these things and you, you sort of get a little dogmatic about an outcome that you wanna see happen. But I'm reminded through that step of rinsing or the step of scraping that I'm doing it because I don't actually wanna be in total control of the outcome. I wanna be surprised by the outcome. So then after that rinsing stage, I uh, put them between boards so that they don't curl up too much when they dry. So they're fairly flat. And then I reassemble the whole drawing um, the way it was when I first transcribed the imagery onto it. Um, and I use an archival glue and I use a special archival tape on the back to kind of assemble the whole thing. Um, and then from there, 
more things ensue. You know, I refine the line work that's already there. I add those radiating lines at the edges or call out different forms depending on, you know, whatever I'm going to do next. Um, but that's kind of how the rinsing comes into play. Um, and that video is just kind of a quick, you know, whatever time lapse um, video because it's, it's fairly laborious process. Excellent. I have a question from Allison. In addition to introducing a wider frame of reference, do the Renaissance sources in these new works make you think more about the human figure and narrative? Um, definitely. That's a great, a great question because there isn't a lot of overt human figuration in my work, except where the object that I'm picking up that I'm co-opting happens to be of a figurative nature. Um, and so, yes, these are populated <laughs> with lots of figures and lots of people. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I did a lot of figure drawing in art school like most art students do. I didn't have a, a particularly strong appetite for it, but I appreciate kind of the part of the brain that it activates and engages uh, sort of drawing from nature, so to speak. Um, and it's funny, but I kind of remembered how much I miss exercising that part of my brain. So in that regard, um, it's sort of brought a little more thought about figurative references into my work. And actually I'm working on a piece of sculpture right now over here that seems to want to become a kind of a, an exquisite corpse because of the way it's kind of this weird these weird parts coming together and I have this strong urge to attach some highly rendered human limbs to it or legs to it. So that's probably coming out of having made these drawings. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question fully, but that's an aspect of it. Okay, excellent. Um, I have a question from Michelle. The wall reliefs are the positive shapes versus the negative shapes of the drawings. Can you speak to your interest in transcription as a driving force in your work and how would you describe transcription as different from appropriation or how they relate to one another? So I guess appropriation in the strictest sense is a literal take the object from this context and just shift the context. So you know obviously we have Duchamp in large part to thank for that. Um, with the urinal, although I guess we've learned now that it was a student of his that, that actually did that piece. But um, uh, certainly turning that into a legacy, we have him to thank for it. Um, so I guess my appropriation as transcription is sort of one further step of abstracting it. And maybe that comes from the fact that I, I started out mostly as kind of an intuitive gestural painter. Um, even though I was highly influenced by and, and you know, uh, absorbed by all these cultural icons that I started seeing from childhood in museums in a totally non-hierarchical way, you know, looking at something made in Japan and then looking at something made in the 1950s in New York and then looking at something made in Persia in the 13th century and just really having no hierarchical association to any of it. So it was just kind of this wash of references. Um, but I think by transcribing them, it's a, a, an abstracting step that allows me to start to look at how they relate to other things as opposed to the thing itself. And that's ultimately, I think, what I'm driven by is the the relationships between parts, not necessarily the parts themselves. Um, and so transcribing or silhouetting um, or stenciling in some cases, you know, these are all ways to further abstract that object and see what kind of charge persists um, or how that charge changes with the contextual shifts that I'm imposing versus the ones that history, time and, and you know, cultural exchange have imposed. Okay, we have one more question. This comes from Julia Kunin. Can you speak about the transformation that possibly takes place when you appropriate ritual objects and fetishes? 
Well, I mean, like I was saying earlier, I guess that I, I see ritual objects as having a, a, at least in my view, somehow of a more intense charge. And granted, I mean, I, when I first started encountering these things, I didn't know that they were ritual objects. I didn't know what the purpose was. I often don't now. And sometimes a lot of the stuff that we see in museums, the intended use even with ritual objects is still somewhat speculative. Um, and yet I find that those things, I don't know. I don't, I, my theory is that the mindset of the maker imbues them with this more intense kind of charge their intended purpose and use over time imbues them with a more intense kind of charge. Um, I guess because a lot of these rituals are religious in nature, um, you know, there are big questions at play in the minds of the maker and in the minds of the, the you know, initiates or whatever you want to call them who are actually using these things. And I don't know, perhaps that embeds and imbues more sort of intense charge so when I'm appropriating from those things, um, you know, I'm engaging with and resonating off of whatever I'm feeling from these things. Um, and perhaps it's slightly more intense or more vivid than, um, than say when I'm looking at a, I don't know, Louis the 16th chair, which is equally intriguing and equally speaks to the culture from which it emanates but uh, doesn't necessarily resonate quite as intensely on its own, on, you know, in its own right. Uh, maybe in a certain context it does, maybe in relation to something else, it starts to kind of percolate more. Um, so um, yeah, that would be one distinction in appropriating ritual objects versus other kinds of things. Um, we have a couple more quick questions coming in. I think after these two, we'll, we'll um, end here. We've got a few more minutes. Um, so this is from Michelle, the kind of a follow-up to, to your answer to her question about transcription. Is transcribing the objects a way of feeling the object or getting closer to it? Do you feel you have a deeper connection to them or is it more of a question of abstracting from their great lines? I think it's kind of both. I think about that a lot when you say great lines, it's there's a kind of an aesthetic self-consciousness or contrivance or bias perhaps that I, that I have just, you know, um, <clears throat> and I, I try to adopt a more objective and detached um, kind of approach but that is happening i can't deny it i mean duchamp talked about that like despite the fact that he tried not to make his uh choices of you know found objects um uh not to have any bias aesthetic bias he admitted that it's virtually impossible to take that out so that's part of it i'm sort of resonating and grooving on the sort of arc of a certain line or a certain passage around that object um, for sure, that's definitely there, but it's also a way of coming to understand that thing. I mean, I, I see, for example, I'm, I'm totally obsessed with, uh, reliquary figures from the Fang culture in, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And, um, I appreciate them more and understand form better when I see them because I've, traced around them and I've cut them out and I've looked at photographs from so many different angles of these things and in so many different kinds of lighting that when I look at them in person, I experience them more vividly, I think, and I appreciate subtlety and nuance and invention and creativity in these forms uh, because I spend so much time, you know, addressing these, these contours, so to speak. Um. Okay, we have one more and this will be the last question and then we'll wrap it up. This is from Kimberly. How do you balance your studio time between painting and the wall reliefs? And sculpture, um, she says sculpture. So I know there's right. other sculptures you're working on as well. Right. Um, 
It sort of depends. I mean, obviously in preparation for an exhibition, you know, uh, I had a kind of a sense of the space in the gallery and the scale of the drawings and kind of what I felt we might have room for in there and the number of kind of studies I had prepared. So, um, you know, those take a lot of time and there's a lot of steps involved. Um, so those took a lot of my attention in the lead up to the show and the wall reliefs um, uh, as a new body of work were really pulling me away from the drawings. Honestly, there was a part of me that really wanted, you know, now I have like so many ideas and so many more ways I want to expand on the potential of this, these devices and the wall reliefs that they're kind of taking over the studio for the time being. Um, but what's interesting about the question for me is sort of how and why these other bodies of work are being prioritized. So, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of these drawings in this style and they were sort of taking over my practice for a long time. And part of that was because I had opportunities to exhibit them. And, and part of it was just because I had so many studies and ideas I wanted to develop um, that I got to the point where I felt like I had been putting too many of these other ideas, sculpture and these reliefs and other things on the back burner to finish projects, to meet deadlines and things like that, that I had to kind of make a pact with myself that I wouldn't make any more drawings in that series or that body of work until I fully executed one of these other ideas. And that an example of that is the bronze sculpture I made year before last where I incorporated African masks and tinker toys. And that totally took over the studio, totally took over my practice for a period of time. And then sort of once I finished that, I'm like, okay, now I'm permitted <laughs> to make a few more of those drawings. Um, and so now I have a little more of a balance. Uh, I had actually moved into this studio partly because it was too hard to do sculpture and painting and drawing at the same time in my old space. Here I can have a number of sculptures in process. And I'll wander over and show you guys a few more of these before we close out here. Um, so like here's a piece that I'm playing with where I took the silhouette of an African mask and then I made this sort of cubistic rendition in cardboard that I covered in resin and I've attached it to this fine and you know this has a ways to go um, and I'm playing with the silhouette of you know a classical bust and these kind of tinker toys almost in the form of some sort of constellation. Um, there's some mask forms back there that I'm playing with um, but this space has allowed me to have a little more balance. You know, I can have these wall reliefs going and I can have drawings and paintings going a little more in a more balanced way. Um, so there's no real rule about how I prioritize, but uh, here I can sort of, you know, have a lot of things going at once. So. That's, that's great, Bo. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up. Thank, right. you. Well, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for hosting this event. Um, it's yeah. fun to hear people's thoughts and to share my ideas and so forth. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Bo. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. If you are in Houston and haven't been by to see the show, make sure to make an appointment with us. Uh, the show closes on December 30th. And that's it. Thanks, Bo. Sure thing. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Take care.